Hey everybody, Dr. McVeary here with another Teaching 101 video. And in our last video, we really talked about the difference between a learning objective and a test objective. And a test is a form of assessment. And that's why in this video, I want to cover um, how your learning objectives must drive your assessments. But first, a, a little word about assessments. They, are, they involve an instrument to measure some kind of change um, in state. Uh, a thermometer is an instrument that measures changes in state of temperatures. And when it comes to assessment, you, the teacher, you are the best instrument. You know, you have your eyes, your ears, your wait time, and even your teacher stare. You know, we could actually just take an entire class on how to do use those. But... In the end, I mean, that a lot of your observation will be your assessment. You'll walk around the room and you'll be able to understand where your students need help. You'll be doing and giving feedback, you know, and a lot of just-in-time teaching by using yourself as the assessment instrument. That being said, how do you get started with um, aligning learning objectives to your assessments? Well, just go back and begin with the verbs. If you align the assessments to your verbs, you probably are going to do enough in terms of developing the right kind of assessment for a learning activity or, or like say a group of activities or even a unit. Say for example, we go back to the um, causes of the Industrial Revolution. I could, if my learning objective was list the causes of the revolution, my assessment task might say fill in the table. If my um, assessment, to, if my learning objective was compare the causes of the Industrial Revolution, my assessment task might be complete the Venn diagram. If my assessment task was evaluate the impact of the um, causes of the Industrial Revolution, I might ask you to write an essay. But hold up! What if somebody isn't really good at writing? What if they're just learning how to speak English? Are we going to be uh, measuring our learning objectives now? Or are we conflating that with writing? And that it gets us to the idea of, are our measures valid and reliable? Um, and when we say valid, we mean, am I measuring what the verbs and nouns that I say I'm going to measure? You know, so if I, um, and that means that the actual measurement is valid, you know? Um, reliable, on the other hand, is will I consistently get the same measure every single time? So think of like a scale of, of my weight. If I have it set 10 pounds below uh, my actual weight, I can get a reliable score every single time because I step on the scale and it always shows me my, my weight minus 10. Is that a valid score? No, that has nothing to do with my weight. You know, it has more to do with like, why did I turn down, turn it down um, 10 pounds? So an instrument um, can be reliable and not valid, but something can never be reliable if it doesn't have validity. If you're not measuring what you say you're going to measure, it doesn't matter. So that's why we always go back to the verb and then consider the, the knowledge that you want to teach. That's how you can just do a basic check of validity and reliability. And as a classroom teacher, you know, you're not... You're not doing this um, if it's just for an assignment in your, in your class. You don't have to worry about reliability as too much as you're just trying to get a feel of where the students are. However, say you teach high school. This is a midterm for, the, um, for a final and your students are fighting for you know, who's going to get class rankings. Now suddenly reliability matters a little bit more because it has more consequential validity. The, the, the actual like what the results are being used for has more impact on who's taking the test. So there we put more effort into making sure it's reliable. But when we're just talking about connecting our learning objectives and our lesson plans to our assessments, we just need to make sure that we've matched up the verbs to our um, learning objectives. And that usually is enough. Um, even if we're talking our, our formative and summative assessments. And when you're thinking about the difference between those formative and the summative assessments, formative assessments, are that, that gives you data for learning. You know, what do you need? It's progress monitoring. What are groups of students following and like missing the same kind of skills? So you could do a mini lesson. 
Um, do you need to move different students along because of the, that they're further along in their progress? Summative data, that's just more for demonstrating growth or you know, your effect, efficacy. How well did your entire class do on a unit? Um, and you do use it, you, know, you can score them and you can rank for achievement um, in different populations. Um, so it's, it's also data for instructional growth. You know, it's data that you bring back and look at how your school's doing overall. In the classroom, we're often talking about that formative data. So where do you as a teacher begin? Well, I like starting when I'm thinking about my lesson plans, and this is the way that I always grade lesson plans, is I will go read your learning objectives and then scroll, boop, go right down to your assessment plan. And what you should be asking and what I ask is, okay, what will the students do? Will that, does that match the verbs of the learning objective? Does the assessment elicit evidence of, their, um, of, of growth and work? You know, if, are you, if you're telling me that students are working on this kind of knowledge and this kind of verbs, will I see bits of that knowledge and verbs in the assessment? And then finally, do you get results as a teacher that you could take back and inform your practice? Because that's what data decision-driven teaching means, is that you take this assessment data, even if it's the stuff that you do right quick on your feet through just-in-time teaching, but you use that to drive your instruction. So I'm going to give you a quick activity that you can do if you want to work on your assessment skills. Say, for example, I give you a list of verbs. Well, um, we have a three-column table, and you have the word recall. Well, how can you measure recall measurements? Well, you'd use multiple choice. And then what can you do with those scores? You can check the accuracy, but you can also do like item level analysis. Are there some items that everybody just got wrong? Which means they're probably not good items. But take the word apply. Let's put that in our table. All right, so how could I, you know, what would be kind of ways to assess how they apply the lesson? Well, think about like problem sets in mathematics or a case study in a business class. You know, those are things that you might score with a rubric. You know, and they, but they could be accuracy. The problem sets in math can be scored for accuracy. And then think about words like create. And now we're talking plan. And this could be your longer term projects or um, an essay or say a portfolio in art, a juried art portfolio. You know, that's a different kind of assessment. So if you want to keep working on your assessment skills and matching learning objectives to meeting your assessments, just take a list of Bloom's verbs and continue this three table exercise as you go through each one of the labels.